Dr. John Moss lives locally, but he hails originally from Rockbridge County, Virginia in the Shenandoah Valley. He received his undergraduate degree from Washington and Lee University. He received his master's degree from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. And he received his PhD from the Ohio State University. He currently works as education specialist for the new National Museum of the United States Army at Fort Belvoir, scheduled to open this year, where he develops exhibits and works with programs in education. And tonight he will recount the bloody battle of, the, of, Gil of Guilford Courthouse, as well as the grueling campaign in the South that led up to it, which was a, a vital part on the road to American independence. After the lecture, I do want to note that he will share ways that he can arrange to send you a signed book, if you would like. So without further ado, Dr. John Moss. Okay, thank you. First, I want to thank Jim and Michelle and everybody at the Lyceum for hosting me. Um, I didn't realize I was the first one back since the break, so that's an honor. <coughs> Excuse me, and I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> um, tonight, we're going to talk in general about the Guilford Courthouse campaign and the, uh, the battle itself, uh, not in excruciating detail, but more of an overview. Um, this was a, a battle that was of great interest to me, uh, having lived in the Greensboro area from about 1998 to 2002. Um, I was lived about 40 minutes from there in UNC Greensboro, where I got my uh, master's degree also uh, very close to the battlefield. So uh, one of the reasons that I decided to write a book is because I wanted to learn more about the battle. And <clears throat> my advisor at Ohio State used to, used to tell me and the rest of his students is that you, um, you never learn so much about a subject as when you write about it. And so I knew the old overall narrative, I knew the story, um, but once, once I started writing about it and getting into the details and trying to find, well, let me confirm when this happened or where that maneuver was or who was here, uh, it, it really made a big difference in trying to uh, uh, reinterpret interpret the battle. Um, so I'm gonna start with a brief overview um, following the map here that you see. Uh, about the campaign that led to Guilford Courthouse, which on the map here is in the top part of the middle of the map. And then we will go into um, Nathaniel Green's taking over the American forces in the South and then the battle itself. So let's start with why the British were in the Carolinas. The British became involved in the Carolinas in the latter part of 1778 and they were able to capture Savannah. Uh, they almost was, were able to capture Charleston. And they realized um, that, we, that there were a lot of loyalists in the Revolutionary War, South Carolina and North Carolina, and they hoped to tap into that, <clears throat> that support, which they believed was, was there. So the the war efforts in the north had come to somewhat of a stalemate. Um, the last major battle that was fought in the north uh, in New Jersey was Monmouth Courthouse in June of 1778. And in 1778, the nature and the, 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 the nature of the war changed significantly when France entered the war on the side of the Americans. So now, if you picture yourself as a British planner or a minister or a top general trying to win the war of the rebellion, put down the rebellion, reclaim the colonies, all of a sudden now, your, your enemy of centuries is now your enemy again, France, right across the channel so England always subject to a cross-channel invasion. But more importantly, the British possessions in the Caribbean were now subject to seizure by the French Navy and Army. And the French possessions in the 
the Caribbean were very, very valuable. Um, there weren't just islands, tiny islands where they could use uh, as a naval base. The sugar and the um, uh, sugar products coming from those island, islands were very valuable. So all of a sudden, the British kind of pull up their stakes in Philadelphia <clears throat> and move back to New York, where their headquarters, their main British headquarters had been since 1776. So with, 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 this, with the war not going well in um, the northern uh, colonies, they decided to focus instead on the southern colonies. And that would have given them not only possession of some valuable tobacco areas, but also put their base, uh, put another base closer to the Caribbean. So that's why they were interested in the South. So the, the, the culminating effort to make a significant invasion of the South came when they invaded South Carolina uh, and laid siege to Charleston from February through May of 1780. And um, the American garrison there surrendered on May 12th. Uh, they had to surrender thousands of Continental troops and thousands of militia troops and hundreds of cannons and ammunition and supplies, which were always in very, very short supply in the South during the revolution. So there's tremendous victory and it almost wiped out probably 80 to 90 percent of the Continentals in the South. It discouraged the militia from turning out. Um, and so again that was May 12th of 1770, I'm sorry, 1780. So um, if we could go back to the first map, we'll talk about how the British went into South Carolina. Um, after the fall of Charleston, the um, British decided to fan out into South Carolina. Now, Charleston, one, there you go, right there. Uh, Charleston is just south of this map on the coast. Most of you probably know where Charleston is. And the British decided to occupy as much of South Carolina as possible. So if you look in the center of your map, there's a place called Sherraw Hill. And down below that to the left is Camden. And you can see Rocky Mount. And on the far left is 96. Those are all British outposts that they use to control the countryside. So Cornwallis, uh, uh, Lord Cornwallis, uh, Lieutenant General Charles, Lord Cornwallis was the British commander after the siege of Charleston. And so he moved forces into these strategic locations, uh, tried to help the loyalists in, the, in South Carolina by um, turning them into militia companies and uh, putting down the patriots and taking their property and supplies. So eventually the British moved north to Camden, South Carolina, which you can see on your map, uh, kind of a little bit left and down from the center of the map. And there he met the American army under General Horatio Gates on the 16th of August, 1780, and soundly defeated him. The Americans had to run from the field. The Continentals were scattered. They went back up into North Carolina and tried to regroup in Charlotte and eventually Hillsborough, which is in the top right-hand corner of this map. So Cornwallis had won a tremendous victory and pursued up north toward Charlotte. As he went gradually and carefully advancing north toward Charlotte, a part of his army moved to his left, meaning the west, and were defeated at the Battle of King's Mountain in October 1780 about six weeks after Camden, so about seven weeks after Camden. That's on your map, about halfway up the map on the left-hand side, you see King's Mountain. So Cornwallis had almost made it to Charlotte, but when so many of his troops were wiped out at King's Mountain, he retired to the town of Winsboro, which is also on the map, just to the left of Camden. 
And there he sat and waited reinforcements, waited for his men to get healthy, and waited for more supplies until January. At that time, the Americans had been reinforced and they had a new commander. And on December 2nd, General Nathaniel Green rode into the Army's headquarters at Charlotte. So let's uh, go off the map temporarily. So Nathaniel Green was a 41-year-old, 42-year-old uh, officer and a very, very interesting character of the revolution. And it's one of the reasons why I wrote this book because I was so impressed by him. Uh, my dissertation at Ohio State was on North Carolina and the revolution. And much of this, much of which was about Green. And the more I had worked on Green during my graduate school, the more I wanted to know a lot about him. So he was uh, an untrained soldier, and yet he rose to be a major general. He grew up in a Quaker family, and yet he became a soldier. He walked with a distinctive limp from his early adolescent days, and yet uh, he was able to uh, endure all the sufferings in the field and camp and battle. Uh, he was largely uneducated in the sense that uh, unlike Jefferson and Hamilton and Madison, uh, he did not have formal education beyond what we would call secondary school now, and yet he taught himself. And his writings are characterized by a lot of references to Shakespeare and the Greek and Roman poets and uh, the uh, uh, heroes of the ancient world like Hector and Lysander. So he's a very interesting person, very, very interesting uh, commander. So he took over in December of 1780. So let's go to our second map, if we could. Green was appointed in October of 1780 by Washington. Congress asked Washington who he wanted or would recommend for the command of the Southern Army. And there you go. Um, they uh, also, the South Carolina delegation to the Continental Congress really pressured Washington to name Green. So Washington named Green. He was appointed officially by Congress and set off for his new job from the West Point area uh, where he was um, serving only two weeks as commander after the treason of Benedict Arnold. That's who took over for Benedict, Benedict Arnold at, at West Point. So Green brought with him some troops, not much. Um, he included the uh, cavalry and infantry force of Light Horse Harry Lee, which uh, all Alexandrians and Northern Virginians know very well. And um, Green began a ride south from, <coughs> excuse me, from, um, from the West Point area um, to take up his command. So on this map are most of the locations of his route. So he um, arrived at Annapolis in October or no, late October and to discuss getting supplies and money from Maryland because a lot of the Continental troops in North Carolina were from Maryland. Uh, so he stayed at the capital for a few days and then rode south. He crossed overland from Annapolis, crossed the Potomac at Alexandria and then rode south to Richmond to meet uh, Governor Jefferson and the Virginia legislature. And I always like to say he basically took Route 1 south, uh, almost, because he went from Alexandria to Colchester, uh, Dumfries, Fredericksburg, Hanover Courthouse, and finally to Richmond, where he also tried to get money and supplies. Now, one of the, one of the officers he brought with him was Baron von Steuben, which most people remember as the drill master of Valley Forge, 
who drilled and taught the American Army European tactics and drill and made them into a better fighting machine to defend America and battle the British in a traditional European fashion. Well, von Steuben came south with uh, Green, and Green recognized that Virginia was really where the logistics were. In other words, the supplies, new recruits, training centers, repair facilities, uh, two forges and ironworks in Fredericksburg, depots near Charlottesville. That's where a lot of the logistics were happening. So he left von Steuben in Richmond and Chesterfield to be the uh, facilitator of logistics. In other words, the guy who was gonna push things along and get men, money, munitions, and food down into the Carolinas. So Green went down to Charlotte by way of Hillsboro, Guilford Courthouse, and Salisbury in the Carolina Piedmont. That's how he arrived at Charlotte December 2nd and took over. So um, at this point, Jim, let's go back to the first map. Okay, so after he, uh, Cornwallis was reinforced with troops at Winsboro on your map there, uh, he decided to move north again and invade North Carolina. He sent a separate column of cavalry and infantry to the west to look for a detachment of Green's army under Daniel Morgan, who had moved to Virginia. He was a uh, some of you may know, he, he lived in the area near uh, Winchester and Berryville, Virginia, in Clark County. So the detachment was led by, uh, the British detachment was led by Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton. Uh, he had a, a notorious reputation as a hard-hitting officer, take no prisoners. And if, you, if you've seen the movie, The Patriot, you don't have to admit it among your friends, but if you saw that movie, the character that was supposed to be Tarleton was Tavington, uh, if you remember that movie. Came out somewhere around 2000 or 2001. So Tarleton and Morgan met in battle at Cowpens, which is on the left, of the left side of the map, on January 17, 1781, and the Americans won a significant victory. Tarleton's force was almost completely wiped out. Th almost a thousand British prisoners were captured, two cannons, medical equipment, musical equipment. Um, but Morgan decided that he was gonna link up with Green uh, so that the Americans had a bigger force. So Morgan and his men, uh, Jim, let's go to the second map again, thank you. Uh, Morgan and his men and, uh, be, uh, headed from Cowpens, which is just on the bottom left of this map, over toward the Catawba River, which isn't labeled, but if you look at the word Salisbury, the river is, that's running through the letter L is the Catawba. Meanwhile, Green was gathering the rest of his forces uh, initially at Salisbury, but then later at Guilford Courthouse. So the Green wanted to concentrate his men. Now you can see that the rivers here, the, the, the Catawba, the Yadkin, and the other rivers that are near Hillsborough and Guilford Courthouse, they run north-south. Um, they're from the north to the south. And a river is a great place to use as a defensive position when the enemy is greater than you are. Cornwallis had about 5,000, 5,500 men. Green, almost always between 1,000 and 2,500, a lot of them militia, not very good troops. So Cornwallis was able to push Green back from the Catawba and back off the Yadkin. And so Green concentrated at Guilford Courthouse and realized the British are too strong, they're coming at me, I've got to retreat across the Dan River, which you can see on your map. 
near the North Carolina Virginia border. So I can't, I won't really get into the details because it would take too long, but at this point, there occurred an incident that was called the Race to the Dan, where the British chased Green, and Green had to get across the Dan before the British caught him. It was a very close run thing from the middle of February to the end of February, and Green was able to cross the Dan at Irwin's Ferry and Boyd's Ferry, which is not on your map, but if you're familiar with that area, it is, it is near or is at what is now South Boston, Virginia in Halifax County. Cornwallis was not able to prevent Green from crossing. Green took all the boats to his side of the river, and so Cornwallis had nothing else to do except retreat to Hillsborough. So, Cornwallis retreats to Hillsborough at the end of February, and then begins a period of kind of a cat and mouse game between Hillsborough and Guilford Courthouse. Green wanted to shadow Cornwallis's army, but not get too close such that Cornwallis turned on him and struck. So it's kind of like watching, watching an alligator. You, know, you kind of want to look at it up close to see what it looks like, but don't get too close because it'll turn around and bite you and bite you pretty good. So for about two weeks, the armies maneuvered around Hillsborough and Guilford Courthouse um, until about the 9th or 10th of March, 1781. At that point, all the stars seemed to align finally for the Americans. Remember, they had, they had, had, to, re they had, had to surrender Charleston they got beaten really bad at Camden. They were pushed back from Charlotte all over into Virginia. But now several things occurred. First of all, Green's Continental Forces were reinforced by additional Maryland and Virginia regiments. Second, a lot of the North Carolina militia county uh, militia companies from the eastern and Piedmont counties had mobilized and joined the army near Guilford Courthouse. Again, uh, additionally, as well, Green received over a thousand Virginia militia troops march into his camp only about two days before the battle. And many of those militia troops had seen continental service earlier in the war. So by this point, Green's army is probably over, over 4,000 men. Cornwallis is down to about 1,800 to 2,000 men. And Green decides, I'm going to go ahead and try to fight a battle while I have this, these kind of troops. So let's advance one more map. OK, this is the battlefield of Guilford Courthouse. So if you've never been down to the battlefield, it's part of the National Park Service sites. They have preserved approximately 50% of the battlefield, including the core area. And um, it's located several miles north of downtown Greensboro. So one of the myths about the battle that I bring out in my book that other historians do not, is that prior to the battle, in fact, up until the very night before the battle on March 15th, Green was trying to attack Cornwallis's forces. Almost every other book, map, article, encyclopedia entry, uh, brochure, website states, that Green decided to take up a defensive position at Guilford Courthouse and let Cornwallis attack him. And that the month before when his army had gathered at Guilford Courthouse before going to the Dan River, Green had looked at it and decided, wow, what a great place for a battle that's, that's defensive in nature. That is not true. Green's correspondence Light Horse Harry Lee's correspondence, uh, the letters of William Washington, uh, a, a, a Continental Cavalry officer, 
uh, St. George Tucker from Williamsburg, some of the men in the ranks, uh, even some of the British uh, officers after the battle, they all state in one way or another that Green was moving toward Cornwallis to attack him. However, what happened was Cornwallis was about six or seven miles away from Guilford Courthouse, and he decided that Green had gotten so close that he would attack him. And Green had spies and scouts and dragoons out watching and listening, and they heard around three in the morning of the 15th, the British Army begin to stir and march on the old Salisbury Road, which is that road on this map that runs from the bottom left of the map to the top right. Once they got that word to Green, Green said, okay, well, if they're coming at me, I'm going to stay here at Guilford Courthouse and take up defensive positions. Now, this was a pretty good place to do that. And Green used a formation here. His army, in, in case you're having a little trouble reading this, the British are in red on this map and the Continentals and militia are in blue. So Green took up a position where he had three lines. His first line was in the middle of your map. And there he put the North Carolina militia on either side of the road at the edge of the woods with a rail fence. And militia troops were notoriously unreliable. And they were often untrained, they had been drafted, they were not anywhere near as good as advancing redcoats with fixed bayonets. But Green took advantage of this and said, look, just fire two or three volleys at the British as they're advancing, then retreat back to the second line. So it kind of took the sting out of them being afraid when they knew that all they had to do was fire two or three volleys and, <coughs> excuse me, retire. In his second line, which you see behind, there's two kind of short uh, positions there on either side of the road in navy blue. That's the Virginia militia. Now these guys were from Rockbridge, Augusta, Prince Edward, Lunenburg, Halifax, and Henry County in Bedford. These were kind of frontier uh, backcountry men who knew how to use their guns, and many of them had already been in the Continental Army or had been in previous campaigns, including cowpens. And they were in a very brushy area that made a British, uh, big British formations marching at them. All of a sudden, in the brush, uh, it, it disrupted the British uh, uh, attack, which was Green's, uh, Green's objective. Then finally, you see up at the top of your map where it says Continentals, there are two Virginia Continental units you see and two Maryland units. And they were on a ridge near the courthouse in front of a road that runs off to the top left. So this is what, what modern strategists and modern officers in, in, in the army would call a, a defense in depth. So the first two lines were designed to blunt the British head-on attack until they were bloodied and tired, and then they faced Green's Continentals. Now, the, the issue here, though, was Cornwallis and his men were veterans. He had very highly trained and extremely experienced troops. In addition to his infantry, uh, British infantry, he had a Hessian regiment, he had Tarleton's cavalry, he had artillery, and his army was used to moving ahead, firing a few rounds, and then fixed bayonets charge. Not a lot of finesse. So as you can see, Cornwallis arrived and put part of his men on either side of the road and attacked. So he attacked the first line of, Virginia, of uh, North Carolina militia there. And the North Carolina militia on their left and their right, they were buttressed or reinforced with, uh, with uh, Lee's cavalry and riflemen, uh, William Washington's troops, 
they were they were the there were veteran units on the left and the right to prevent a flank attack by the British. The British went head on into the North Carolinians, and despite Greene's hopes and admonitions, most of them on the road fled like rabbits when the British came across the field with fixed bayonets and charge. Not all of them, uh, but a lot of them. The flank units that you see on the left and the right of the American line, they held for a while. Uh, the British on the right-hand side of the road were the Highlanders and the Hessians, and they began to attack toward their right. And you can see the dotted lines heading way off to the right, away from the main battlefield. That became a separate action. But the rest of the British charged straight on. It became very confusing. There was a lot of brush. This was not open tobacco fields or wide open forests. This was very thick underbrush, pine trees, hard to see. It, was, uh, it hadn't started to rain yet, but it was going to rain. So between the mist and the, the gun smoke from muzzleloaders with black powder, it became very confusing. So the British hit the second line, which were the Virginians, and they hung around for a while. And there's a lot of British uh, accounts saying that the second line was a tough nut to crack. Uh, some of the original statements by Virginia troops who fought there, they said they fired 14, 15, 16 rounds from their cartridge boxes. That's a lot of ammunition to shoot at somebody coming at you without running. So. Eventually, the Virginia militia had to retire, and they retired off to the rear and to their left. So all of a sudden, the last line that the British came up upon was the Continental Line that you see there, of Virginia and Maryland. Now, they're on a hill, and when the British arrive near them, they're on a hill, hill, hill a ridge too, but there's a fairly deep swell between the two, kind of a draw with a, with a little creek going in between. The British on the right, on their right, attacked the American left. And if you see the two units that near the abbreviation MD for Maryland, the one on the far American left near the courthouse, they were a unit that had only recently been formed, they were not well trained, they had too few officers. And when the British guards came across that little valley and up the hill, they ran. They totally broke. The British captured some of them, they captured artillery. Thing is though, the Americans did not see that right away. Because of the lay of the land, the woods and the smoke, Green did not know that regiment had fled. And so the uh, Virginia Continentals had thwarted at least one attack. Finally, the Maryland Regiment that's on the left of the map, which would have been the Maryland Regiment on the right from Green's perspective, that was the first Maryland, one of the best units in the Continental Army and probably the best one in the South, led by John Eager Howard of Baltimore. Uh, they realized that the other Maryland regiment had fled, so they turned to meet the British at the same time American cavalry under William Washington came up and smashed into the British attack on the British right. And that really stunned Cornwallis. Now at this point, all the British regiments were basically online ready to attack, and Green had a decision to make. The American army in the South was the living symbol of the revolution. Without an army, there was no revolution at this point with the British occupying Charleston, Savannah, Wilmington, they had an army on the march. So Green, who was a prudent, uh, a moderate thinker decided that now was the time to withdraw his army, which was still largely intact, rather than to risk it and being totally devastated and there no longer being any other American army in the South. 
So he withdrew his forces, and unlike Camden, which was a complete rout, the Americans withdrew to the left of your map along that road. That is the Reedy Creek, uh, Ro Reedy Fork, I'm sorry, the Reedy Fork Road that heads toward uh, a position Green had designated prior to the battle, which all his troops knew, called Speedwell Ironworks. Uh, in, in today's Guilford County, and, or just north of there, and it was on Troublesome Creek, and there Green had a great defensive position if needed. By this time, the British had lost 25% of their men, including a lot of their officers. It started to rain, and Green was not routed. The Americans were still intact they withdrew in, in what they would call in the 18th century a, in good order and three miles up that road is the reedy fork and after the last americans had crossed green had the bridge destroyed and the virginia continentals to guard the bridge so the british were not going to be able to attack so they came back toward guilford courthouse okay let's um let's get rid of the map Okay, so what happened now? So the British, seeing all these casualties, they were very far from, from Charleston. They had not been resupplied effectively for months. And the day after the battle, Cornwallis decided that he was going to withdraw down the uh, Deep River, which feeds into the Cape Fear River, and eventually goes to Wilmington. Green chased him for a while, tried to, um, tried to force a battle with Cornwallis's rear guard. Wasn't really able to do that, um, but Cornwallis made it to, to Wilmington in uh, early April. So Green, <coughs> about 20 miles from Wilmington, had a decision to make. Do I chase Cornwallis to Wilmington and try to lay siege? which he would never be able to do because the Americans had no Navy to cut off British supplies by water. So Green decided to move into South Carolina. Now, from an 18th century strategic thinking, you would never do that in a European army because it's leaving an enemy force in your rear. It's dangerous. But Green was not a traditional thinker. And he decided if he moved into South Carolina, if the British followed him, they would still be very weak and South Carolina militia forces could operate against the supply lines. Whereas the benefits of moving into South Carolina was that it would look like South Carolina being reconquered. It would give great support and morale boost to Americans and militia and troops in South Carolina, and it would keep an eye on the British situation there. So that's what happened. Cornwallis decided to leave Wilmington April 26th and move north toward Virginia, where all those supplies were coming from. And eventually, uh, by May 12th, he reached Petersburg, and then by October, was in Yorktown, and I don't want to spoil the ending, but I think you know what happens. So the last point I'll make is what was the strategic effect of Guilford Courthouse? In my book, I conclude that it was far more of a turning point and a strategic victory than other Southern battles. For example, after King's Mountain, when Cornwallis lost about a thousand of his loyalist troops, he withdrew temporarily, but then advanced toward Charlotte. After Cowpens, when the Americans won a victory there, Cornwallis still advanced toward North Carolina and toward Green's positions. But it was after Guilford Courthouse that Cornwallis retreated to the coast because he had been beaten soundly, he had been beaten soundly and was out of supplies 
and knew that Green was a dangerous opponent that he had to be, had to be careful of. So at this point, if anyone would like to uh, uh, submit questions or um, Jim uh, can read some of the questions that perhaps uh, already have been asked.